Hey, we're Andrew and Sue Owen. We've been on an adventure with God for many years and we've been pursuing our destiny and in the process, Destiny Ministries and Destiny Churches have been created. And we want you to connect with us with Church Online, all of the different things that we do every week, just so that we can be in touch with you and you can be in connection with us. We're an international family, people from all over the planet, every language going. So wherever you are, we would love to hear from you, share life with you. Let's get on that adventure together and do great things for God. Yeah, we love you. We're praying for you. We're rooting for you. The Well of Wellbeing is a brand new digital ministry where people from all walks of life can engage with personal experiences to enrich their well-being in their walk with God. Our YouTube channel has fresh content updated daily that covers mental health tips all the way to lifestyle conversations on how to keep fit and even recipes. Here are some highlights. You know, there is a release when you learn to say thank you because you start to think of the good things in your life. This I did at like 3 o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. And then the day after I sort of tried out something else. It takes you away from reality for a while. It calms you down, takes your mind off things, and in the end you're left with something beautiful. I think when you go through the adrenaline of it all and you get your name in lights and you've got reporters who want to talk, it's like, oh wow, this is all great. I found myself not really feeling fulfilled. I wasn't really getting a sense of purpose. I started experiencing sadness in a way that I, I, I'm not used to. As things are getting too much, we have family chat um, and just hearing it from them and then get them to help come up with the solutions, letting them express their emotions in a safe way. I didn't learn to deal with how I was feeling. Oh, I'm feeling, uh, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Oh, I'll just take another drink. And it leads nowhere. Like you said, it's a cycle and you're just trying to push that feeling down. You're not dealing with it. People that are, are thinking of ending their lives can have such feelings of guilt and shame and, and worthlessness. And they could be feeling very strongly that God doesn't love them. God isn't there for them. So we can be Christ's love, visible, the hands and feet of Christ to this person. But we have to be cautious about giving platitudes in such a, a, a time of pain. Trying to build that relationship yeah. and, and instilling the hope. Subscribe to our channel to join the conversation. Your story is powerful and can transform the life of others. Would you like to share it? Get in touch. We would love to hear from you. questions why am i here what's the point what difference does my life make thank you why do things that are so bad for us taste so good hey, hey sir do, do you, you pray? pray i don't have an answer for that how can i live life to the full what can i really trust what's my purpose what do you think happens when you die you're going straight to the good lives. does anyone hear my prayer What's for dinner? What will make me happy? Why don't good things last forever? What is God really like? Has anyone else even asked themselves these questions? Hey everyone, I've got an amazing Alpha Online group here. A better place to ask life's big questions. Ask Alpha.
The cry in your heart today should be one of, I am no longer staying here. I am no longer dwelling here. This is not where I stop. This is not where my life is lived out. I am moving forward. I am moving on and I am pressing into the things of God. And I want to encourage you as you do that today, as you stand up again, as you press into the promises of God and as you take hold of Him, He will take hold of you and He will lead you forward into the fullness of the life that He has for you. There are two great scriptures in the New Testament. One of them says, with God, all things are possible. And we believe that. We know God can do anything. But we also read in another place, all things are possible to him who believes. This teaching that we're doing in this series is designed to bring you into that place where you will be fully convinced that you and God make a winning team. We've been hearing great testimony of God's faithfulness in this season. What can our team pray for for you? Do you have a praise report or a testimony that you'd love to share? Send it in. cry in your heart today should be one of, I am no longer staying here. I am no longer dwelling here. This is not where I stop. This is not where my life is lived out. I am moving forward. I am moving on and I am pressing into the things of God. And I want to encourage you as you do that today, as you stand up again, as you press into the promises of God and as you take hold of Him, He will take hold of you and he will lead you forward into the fullness of the life that he has for you. Hey, we're Andrew and Sue Owen. We've been on an adventure with God for many years. 
and we've been pursuing our destiny and in the process destiny ministries and destiny churches have been created and we want you to connect with us with church online all of the different things that we do every week just so that we can be in touch with you and you can be in connection with us we're an international family people from all over the planet every language going so wherever you are we would love to hear from you, share life with you. Let's get on that adventure together and do great things for God. Yeah, we love you, we're praying for you, we're rooting for you. Hi, and welcome to Destiny Church Online. We are so glad that you are connecting with us today, wherever you are from. Do you know that we have a team of hosts and pastors available to chat with you and to pray with you? If you would like prayer, then press that button that says live prayer and the team would be delighted to do that with you right now. Shortly, we are going to hear a life-changing message from our senior pastor, Andrew Owen, who leads and pioneers the Destiny Network all around the world. But right now, let's get ready to worship God. Hi everyone. Welcome to Destiny Church Online. You know in the Bible there are loads of promises and one of them is that the darkness is disappearing and His true light is coming to the earth. So come on, join us in celebrating the name of Jesus. I was
is hope. In the times of trouble, there is hope. And that name is Jesus. He came here to rescue us. And we just want to raise our voices in adoration and sing of how good He is.
I thank you that you are unstoppable. I thank you that we can do all things through you, Jesus. Father God, I thank you and I praise you today. We thank you that we get this opportunity to connect with you, to worship you wherever we are right now. God, we are so grateful that you are in our lives. So Father God, we commit this time to you. We ask you that you would be in it and we just praise your name. Amen. Now it's our time to give. Do you know that we have seen so many people come to know Jesus, praise God, that they're getting connected in with the local church. We're seeing practical needs being met. And you know what? It's because of our giving that we're able to share this gospel right across the world. So today it's so easy for you to give, but before you press that give button, why not take a few moments to yourself and ask God, what do you want me to give today? Come on, let's give together. Let's pray together for our giving today. Father God, I thank you that you are our source and you are our provider. I thank you that we get to connect with you in this way. So today, God, I'm asking that your hand of blessing is over the giving and that we will see a great harvest of fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now it's time for you and I to get into God's word as we hear from our senior pastor, Andrew Owen. Hey, welcome to Destiny Church Online with me, Andrew Owen. We are turning to God's Word today. And as always, God's Word is ready, it's primed, it's in season, and it's current. And as we turn to the Word of God today, of course, it's coming into the midst of certain challenges that so many people have faced around the world this last week or so. Not only have we had to come through a pandemic. Not only have we had to see the crisis in our economy, but most of us were horrified and shocked when we witnessed the terrible atrocities that we saw with George Floyd in America. And that stirred up so many emotions in the hearts of people, particularly black people. And black people do count, do matter. God is interested. God is involved. And in particular today, the Word of God is for you, for them, and for all of us. We've been looking at Psalm 23, the most famous of all Psalms. And it's a claim that 
David made so personally and so profoundly that God was with him, that Jesus was his shepherd, that God was in control of his life. And no matter what's happening to you, through you, or in you, you need to know that God is right there with you. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Of course, Psalm 23 perhaps is the most famous because it talks about, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about not camping in a valley, not staying in a valley. David passed through those valleys, and because there was a shepherd engaging with his life, he passed on into the purposes that God had for him. But here's the thing with valley experiences. You can come through a valley, and you can see it as part of your history. You may be determined, you know, I'm not staying there, I've come through it. You may have a date in your diary when something happened. But even though you've come through the valley and come the other side of it, the memory of that valley, the emotional trauma of that valley, can be as real today as when it first occurred. And all through this week, these past few days, I've been talking to so many black people, particularly those who are a part of our church and church network, black pastors up and down the country. And one of the things they've told me is this, that even as they've watched the horrors emerge in America concerning George Floyd, and even though it's another nation over there, in watching that, it brought back to them vivid memories of racism that they have personally experienced. Some of it was verbal, some of it was physical, all of it was emotional, but it's as if they've been re reliving those moments again. And first of all, we want to say our hearts are with you. Just like the cry that's gone out in the earth, enough is enough. God loves black people. God loves all people. And God is against all racism of every kind. And his encouragement for us, wherever we live, whatever nation we're in, is to find a way forward to walk in the love of God. But the truth is that even if the valley experience that you had or are still having, and as I'm talking to our black brothers and sisters, our church community, and those out in the community, they are making it very clear that racism is still present right here in our country. And all of us are saying enough is enough. But even while we're facing it, and we're facing it together, you are not alone. We are in this as a family. The promise of God's Word is still amazingly true. I am with you. I will not leave you. And that's exactly what David said. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You see, whoever we are, God made us, when we come into his family, a huge, huge promise. That promise is repeated in Hebrews 13, verse 5, where it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Who could make such a promise? I'm sure our mums and our dads and our husbands and our wives and our brothers and our sisters will make those kinds of promises and mean them so intently. But the truth is, so often life's circumstances overtakes our ability to keep a commitment. And we keep failing in so many areas. But you know what? There is a God who's beyond circumstance. There is a God who's above it all. There's a God who is in control, no matter what we see happening in our world at the moment. And it is this God that made a promise, and that promise is deeply personal, and he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the, therefore, even if you're not presently in the valley because something happened last week, last year, or 10 years ago, 
it feels like you're in the valley because the emotion is so strong and so real. But I want to tell you something. Even in that emotion, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And Maybe you are in a current crisis. We've been praying all week for people who have been at death's door because of this terrible virus. We've been praying for people all week who have had major challenges in their family situations. We've been praying for people all week who have had issues with their mental health. They're in that valley right now. Whether it's a memory that's come rushing back because of the things that have happened this last week, whether you are presently in it, if you know Jesus, if you know God, you are part of his family and he is your father and he says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. How amazing is that? So whether you're reliving a trauma, whether you're press, pressing through it, press into God. Press into his love, press into his faithfulness, and press into his commitment for you. Make him bigger than everything else that's going on. And of course, David in this psalm was able to so confidently say that because the Lord, the shepherd, was with him. He wasn't going to leave him in that valley. And do you know what? You will personally come through that valley. And I would like to think that together as Christians, that together as churches, we won't leave our communities or our nation in the valley of racism either. That our voice will be heard that our passion and commitment will be intense, that God will empower us and help us to make a difference and eradicate that scourge out of our communities once and for all so that we can all walk through this world knowing we are equal children of sons and daughters of our God and Father in heaven. But for some Christians, they struggle to believe that God's biggest promise is I will never leave you nor forsake you. For they have been taught over the years, somewhere in their religious experience, that God is actually temperamental. They've been taught that God somehow has such high expectations that the promise he made that he would never leave us is conditional on those expectations. So when they feel, I'm strong, when they feel, I'm doing great, when they feel, you know, I'm walking as a Christian should, or I'm overcoming the challenges that come at me. When I'm overcoming, then God is with me. But if I fail, then God somehow distances himself from me. And there are thousands of Christians who feel that they're in this in and out world with God. Speaking to one black person this week, they said to me and to us that I love the church that we're in because I've never once experienced any kind of racism inside the church. We're an international community of so many races. I think God's love is colorblind. But the challenge I have is when I step out of the church bubble and the Christian community, how do I then walk as a Christian, a black Christian, in a predominantly white world. It's there that I have the struggle and it's there that I need to know how to deal with it. Do I just forgive people when they raise derogatory comments? Do I retaliate? How do I deal with it? And those questions are important and we intend to answer them more fully in these days that just lie ahead of us. But first of all, I want to tell you that in the moment when you don't know which way to turn or how to respond or have the resource or the energy to respond, he is right there with you and he's never going to leave you. And the amazing thing is, Christianity has one of the most dynamic, powerful truths ever. We believe in one God who exists in three persons. There's no other religion on earth that has such a concept. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we have God the Holy Spirit who wants to live inside us and empower us. Paul, when he opens the amazing gospel of Romans, he writes and tells us that he's called to preach the gospel of God. 
And when he says that, he then talks about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In other words, he wants you to know that all of God is for all of you. And you see, I wasn't even raised like that. I was taught that God the Father is like an austere headmaster with his set of rules, and we failed and miserably broken all his rules, so now he's so angry with us, but somehow in his kindness he sends his son for us, so Jesus comes and we connect with Jesus, but we'll always need Jesus because the Father's austere. But I want to tell you, when the Bible says and defines God is love, it's speaking about our Father who is in heaven. And I understand we live in a fatherless world, right? So many families, like my own, where I grew up, father's gone, taken off, no longer engaged, no longer involved. So when we start talking about Father God, it, it's, it's like a strange alien concept inside us. And again, I've spoken to some black people this week who told me that was their personal experience. And they found that when they experienced racism, there was nobody there to help them stand in it, to deal with it, or to come through it. But I want to tell you, that God, our Father, who is in heaven, is madly, passionately in love with you. The gospel was his idea. The most famous verse, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Isn't that amazing? And then there's Jesus Christ, God's Son, who sacrificed himself on a cross. And the Bible says he did that to reconcile us to himself. God wants us as people living on this planet to be reconciled to each other, so there's no room for racism. And further, the Bible says that God has given to us, the church, the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we're meant to be about. But when we see the huge sacrifice that Jesus went through, we know he loves us, and we know he's for us. But sometimes the dilemma comes with the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead who wants to live inside us. For many people were like me, they were told that he is such a Holy Spirit that his mission and his commission, as far as you as a Christian is concerned, is to point out your failures and your faults so that he can process you forward to become like God. I want to tell you that couldn't be further from the truth. There is not one single verse anywhere in the Bible which tells us that's what the Holy Spirit does. Oh, he does it in the world. Jesus said when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will convict the world of sin because they don't know God yet. They haven't got saved yet. And maybe today you're watching and haven't got saved yet and you need to. But you know what it tells us in Romans 8? Who will bring a charge against God, God's elect? It is God that justifies. And I want to tell you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have promised never to leave you, to work together for you. So the Holy Spirit's not going to point out your faults and your failings. He's going to tell you that when we fall and fail and when we sin, he's going to tell us Jesus died for that and you're already forgiven. He's going to tell us that we are accepted and justified before God. Truly, God is for us. But there's another question that comes up when we consider this element. People say, well, I know God won't leave me, but will he punish me? And some terrible things have been said about God and in the name of God. Even, even this last week, while I was studying, I, I read a book by a well-known author, a theologian who I admire and appreciate and love, but he, he, sa he said this one thing. He said, God may well send that disease, that cancer, or that sickness your way to discipline you. And as I read that, I drew back in horror. How could we ever get such an idea that God would punish me in such a way? Oftentimes, when people think those thoughts, they turn to a verse in Hebrews 12, and verses 5 to 6, it says this, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he loves. Strong words, right? And when people turn to that verse, they say, see, these terrible things that happen in my life, that must be God teaching me, or training me, or wanting to bring you into a new place. So you must accept it. And, uh, you know, Sue and I had a, 
had a, a traumatic experience one time in our life. We have five beautiful sons, and we've got a granddaughter and grandsons now, and beautiful girls have come into our family. But our first son died at childbirth. And in that moment, we knew two weeks before he was born that he'd actually died in the womb. And so we had two weeks where we were believing God for a miracle. When that little baby was born, also a boy, his life was already gone. And it was a hugely traumatic moment. But it was amazing what certain Christians would say to us. There were some who comforted us and encouraged us, but there were others who said, God's teaching you something. And even then, I found myself recalling from such a thought. Because this verse here in Hebrews says, my son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom he loves, he chastens and discourages every son whom he loves. First of all, think it naturally. Would any father inflict a disease on any of his children? It's an absurd thought. Would any father inflict suffering on his daughter or his child to teach them a lesson? It's a ridiculous thought. And even Jesus said on one occasion, if you, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? God is good. So how do we explain this verse? Well, often, as is the case so many times, things are lost in translation. What's important that when we come to look at the Word of God, that first of all, what we're reading lines up with the God we know, and God is love. What we're reading lines up with the work that he's done, and he came to save us and to rescue us. What we're reading lines up with his commitments and his promises, and he said he'd never leave us. He said he loved us and was for us. Then, as we look at the text, we hold it up against the God we know and dig a little deeper. And this is what I've discovered when I've looked at this verse. When it says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, we've kind of lost the meaning of that word in translation. We use the word chastening in English as a kind of strict, hard discipline. But the word actually means to train up a child. It's nothing whatsoever to do with the concept of punishment. So what the verse is really saying in Hebrews is, my son, do not despise the training of your life, the shaping. And I am convinced that God is not into punishing me or causing my suffering. My God is good. He's against everything that's dark and evil, and he's for everything that gives life and hope. But he does train me, and he does correct me, and he does teach me, just like I do and have done with my children or grandchildren. And so God wants to train us. Train us for what? to overcome the challenges we face in our own life. And so if the trauma of racist activity has affected the black community and the Christians, God wants to bring you through that. If the church has not known how to deal with that issue, God wants to train us how to deal with that issue so that we become effective in our communities and in our nation. Then we read on and it says, don't be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. That simply means you shouldn't be doing this, do that. God's like a father correcting us, helping us. But then the word that often gives people the problem is and scourges every son whom he loves. I don't know about you, but that verse draws up terrible images in my mind because scourging sounds like a vicious, terrible act. So let's have a look at that for a second and consider it. First of all, many of us, when we read that word scourging, it brings to mind a weapon that the Romans in particular loved using. That weapon looked like this. It was a leather whip with metal barbs woven into it. And it was designed to inflict severe punishment. 
The interesting thing with the Romans was no Roman citizen was ever allowed to receive this. Only slaves and foreigners were allowed to receive it. And the Bible tells us that Jesus himself was scourged, whipped with this. And this thing was such a cruel instrument that when it wrapped itself around your body, in pulling it back, it, would, it was designed to rip flesh out of your body. And Jesus went through that for you and for me. He went through it for our sicknesses and our infirmities. He went through it for our mental challenges and our emotional traumas. Is this verse saying that God will do that to you as a Christian to teach you something? When the Bible says that God the Father took Jesus through it for our sake that we would not have to go through it. And listen, if we had gone through it, we would end up looking like this as Jesus himself did. This is a a shot from the film, the, Mo the Passion of the Christ, and many of us have seen that movie and the horrors that Jesus suffered. And I don't think Mel Gibson came anywhere close to actually showing what Jesus went through for us. The Bible says he was mad beyond recognition. The Bible says he became more hideous than any man on earth of the things that he went through. Is this verse saying that God would do that to us? I don't think so. In fact, other Psalms, like Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5, encourage us to remember God's benefits. It tells us that He has forgiven us all our iniquities. He heals all our diseases. The Bible tells us that He will protect us and keep us. That's God's word to us. So, how did this word scourge end up in this verse? Listen carefully. The letter to the Hebrews, although we're not sure who wrote it, we know who it was written to. It was written to the Hebrews. That is the Jewish community that had come to Christ. And whoever wrote it, most people think it was Paul, but we're not sure. When he wrote that letter, he was writing it to encourage and to comfort Jewish believers who were going through challenges and persecution. And because it was written to the Hebrew believers, guess what? It was written in Hebrew. That New Testament letter was written in Hebrew and later translated to the Greek. And then from the Greek, eventually, to the English. The interesting thing with that word scourge in the Hebrew existed a long time before the weapon existed. And when the word in the Hebrew was originally coined, it had nothing to do with that vicious weapon that the Romans created. The Hebrew original word, I think you pronounce it bikaret, meant this, to inquire deeply. And so, if we take that Hebrew word and put it into our English text, it was says, the Lord loves, he chastens, he child trains, he instructs, he helps them move forward, and he inquires deeply into every son whom he loves. Have you ever known anybody inquire deeply in how you're feeling, how you're thinking, what you've gone through, the emotion in your heart? And even like I've said earlier, the valley may have been a long time ago, but the feeling of it is present today. I want to tell you there's a God who loves you so much that he inquires deeply about those things. And so if you're a part of our black community and you've experienced racism, God inquires deeply into that pain with the full intention of bringing you through. I'm told that when I read and study that when they went then to translate the Hebrew text into the Greek, they wanted to be true to the exact word and so they used the word scourge, which by the time it was then translated into the Greek, had changed its meaning from inquiring deeply into that terrible instrument. And so the imagery in the language is changed and lost. And so it's produced in so many people the sense of God's just waiting to catch them out. But I want to tell you that God's just waiting to catch you up, to love you and to heal you and to bring you through. 
God is so involved with our lives, he inquires deeply. You know, I remember once a pastor even asking me, hey, Andrew, how are you doing? And I'd actually had a health scare at the time. I'd had to go into hospital for some very serious tests. And I began to explain to him what had happened, and he changed the subject. He didn't do it intentionally. He's just preoccupied with other things. And I was taken aback. I stopped and realized he wasn't really asking how I was doing. He was just passing the time of day. But I want to tell you that Godwin says, how are you doing? He wants to know how you're really doing. And when God says, how are you? He wants to know exactly what's going on inside your heart. And the amazing thing is that he inquires deeply and then he will train you up to be a victor in life. The challenge with any kind of racism is that it makes you think you're some kind of second or third class citizen. But I want to tell you that when you are born again, you're a child of God. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And we have to learn, whoever we are, to walk in that divine confidence. God is for you and he will never leave you. He's brought you into his family. Do you know that? That's what he wants you to know. And then the Bible tells me, God is for me. Psalm 56 verse 9, then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. You see, when the Bible says God is for me, and David was able to say in the 23rd Psalm, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, it was telling us God is not passive concerning our challenges, but he's hugely active. Every shepherd in those days carried a rod as an instrument of warfare. They could throw that rod almost like a spear. The Bible tells us that David took out a lion and a bear with a rod. And I want to tell you that God engages with our life actively to protect us and to take care of us. And the Bible says, your staff, they comfort me. Well, when they had a staff, you need to think of like the shepherd's crook. And sometimes when that sheep or that lamb got into trouble or got stuck, or it was on the edge of a precipice, that shepherd's hook could reach down over its neck and just tug it back and pull it into a safe place. And so David is saying, listen, I know God is for me. He's never going to leave me. And sometimes he's going to use that rod to get those enemies off me. And sometimes he's going to lovingly pull me back in line, in heart, so that I can walk into the things that he's got for me. Sometimes God draws me back to keep me safe. And sometimes he engages directly with the enemies that have engaged me. But don't ever think he's going to be passive. And don't ever think he's going to leave you. And don't ever think he's going to send some kind of inflicting punishment on you. Circumstances happen. Valleys occur. Things take place. But listen good. God doesn't teach you in the circumstance. He child trains you. He teaches you in his word. And you learn to apply it to the circumstance. And that's how we turn it. How does he do that? Sometimes he empowers me to stand strong. You know, one of the challenges we have as fallen human beings when we realize we make so many mistakes so often and so regularly that the enemy comes in with accusations and says, who do you think you are? All Christians feel that weight of condemnation. And then if you experience things like racism and you've been left to feel like you don't belong, that condemnation, that sense, it just increases. But he enables me to stand. And the Bible says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God ju that justifies. He will enable you to stand to tell you are my child and I love you. I made you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. He enables me to stand in the middle of all of those things. Sometimes, just like he says, he releases me from fear. We've talked about this already, about fearful moments. But David was able to say, I will not fear. It was a decision he made. Why could he make that decision? Was he just manning himself up? No, he was able to make that decision because he knew it's not the absence of the shadow, it's the presence of the shepherd that makes a difference here. And sometimes he engages actively by sending help from heaven to strengthen me. That's why God puts us in a church family. And you know what? That church family should have every person from every nation on earth represented within it. The Bible promises and says for every tribe, language, and nation he calls us. That's what makes church so beautiful. Wherever 
color we are. We're in this together. And together, we find strength and support. In this, we deal with the challenge. And in this, we adjust, address, and help our communities become all that God intended for them to be. You see, when we have that kind of faith, it does not ignore the problem, but it doesn't let the problem have the last word. We are determined not to let racism have the last word. We are determined not to let fear have the last word. We're not determined to let present valleys or past valleys have the last word. We're not even willing to let our sins, our faults, and our failings have the last word. God will have the last word on my life and yours when we trust him. I will fear no evil. He is right here with me. There are times when God sends angelic help. I've got a load of stories that I could tell about angels stepping into my life. You can read some of them in the book, I Shall Not Want. And you know what? Sometimes God just interferes with life and people realize something else has happened here. Prayers get answered. Doors get opened. Circumstances get changed. But one thing's for sure. He will never leave me. And he will never leave you either. I know that I've spoken so much about some really important Christian things, but potentially you don't know God yet. But in a second, that can change. In a moment, it can be different. And I don't know your story, but God does. I don't know what country you're even living in as you listen to this, but God does. I don't know what you've gone through, what valley you're in, or what valley you've experienced. But I know there is a shepherd who wants to inquire deeply about your life and bring you through. Christians call it being saved or being born again. It means in actuality becoming a part of God's family. God is your father. And it's only possible because Jesus died for us to bring us into that family. When he went to that cross, he took away every sin that you and I have ever committed or will commit and cried out, forgiveness. And you can receive that forgiveness right now. The Holy Spirit then wants to come and live in your heart to give you power to overcome every challenge and to move forward on every day. Maybe you've never prayed a prayer like that, or maybe you did but haven't walked in it. Listen, whether you want to come back to God today or whether you want to give him your life for the very first time, would you let me pray with you? I'm going to pray a short prayer sentence by sentence. But if you need God in your life today, you want to be saved and come back to the Father's house today, why don't you pray this prayer with me? You're borrowing my words, right? But it's the cry of your own heart. You ready? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are good and that you love me and that you are for me. So much so, you sent Jesus to die for me. I receive today that forgiveness would you bring me into your family? Give me your Holy Spirit so that you can live inside me. I thank you that when I call on you like this, you hear me. Thank you for receiving me today. Amen. Wow, if you pray that prayer, it's an awesome prayer, but it's the beginning of a brand new journey. And listen, God doesn't want you to take that journey alone. So if you pray that prayer and you're on church online today, you will see a tab which says live prayer. I'd like you to press that tab right now. Click on that tab right now. And what that will do is the pastors and the hosts that we have online will be right there to pray with you. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, go on to the chat. There's a link. Press that link and they'll be there right there with you to pray with you. And not just pray with you today, but they'll continue to pray with you through this week and beyond that you come into every thing that God's got for you. And even while they're there chatting with you, if you have a personal need, they'll pray for that and help in a practical way. Further, I would like to send you this book called This Is For You. If you press that tab, get onto that link, I'll make sure that this comes out straight to you. Listen, God is for you. He's never going to leave you. Whatever challenge you face, we face, He is committed to bringing us through. He has weapons that are motivated by love to bring us into every good thing. Hope you can join us later today for another broadcast. But until next time, I'm Andrew Owen. This is Destiny Church Online. God bless you.
you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, yeah. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no to wait, Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are. brilliant time we've had today. Wasn't that word amazing? My faith has been stirred and I hope yours has also. Hey, don't rush off, you know, we have the team ready to pray with you. Is there something that you need someone to stand with you in faith? Maybe you want to get connected. 
Maybe you've got some questions. Hang around and the team would love to get connected with you. Hey, we're Andrew and Sue Owen. We've been on an adventure with God for many years and we've been pursuing our destiny and in the process, Destiny Ministries and Destiny Churches have been created. And we want you to connect with us with Church Online, all of the different things that we do every week, just so that we can be in touch with you and you can be in connection with us. We're an international family, people from all over the planet, every language going, so wherever you are, we would love to hear from you, share life with you. Let's get on that adventure together and do great things for God. Yeah, we love you, we're praying for you, we're rooting for you. The Well of Wellbeing is a brand new digital ministry where people from all walks of life can engage with personal experiences to enrich their well-being in their walk with God. Our YouTube channel has fresh content updated daily that covers mental health tips all the way to lifestyle conversations on how to keep fit and even recipes. Here are some highlights. You know, there is a release when you learn to say thank you because you start to think of the good things in your life. This I did at like 3 o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. And then the day after I sort of tried out something else. It takes you away from reality for a while. It calms you down, takes your mind off things, and in the end, you're left with something beautiful. I think when you go through the adrenaline of it all, and you get your name in lights, and you've got reporters who want to talk, it's like, oh wow, this is all great. I found myself not really feeling fulfilled. I wasn't really getting a sense of purpose. I started experiencing sadness in a way that I, I, I'm not used to. As things are getting too much, we have family chat um, and just hearing it from them and then get them to help come up with the solutions, letting them express their emotions in a safe way. I didn't learn to deal with how I was feeling. Oh, I'm feeling, uh, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Oh, I'll just take another drink. And it leads nowhere. Like you said, it's a cycle and you're just trying to push that feeling down. You're not dealing with it. People that are, are thinking of ending their lives can have such feelings of guilt and shame and, and worthlessness. And they could be feeling very strongly that God doesn't love them. God isn't there for them. So we can be Christ's love visible, the hands and feet of Christ to this person. But we have to be cautious about giving platitudes in such a, a, a time of pain, trying to build that relationship yeah. and, and instilling the hope. Subscribe to our channel to join the conversation. Your story is powerful and can transform the life of others. Would you like to share it? Get in touch. We would love to hear from you. questions why am i here what's the point what difference does my life make Thank you. 
why do things that are so bad for us taste so good? Hey Siri, do, do you, you pray? pray? I don't have an answer for that. How can I live life to the full? What can I really trust? What's my purpose? What do you think happens when you die? You'll go straight to the gulags. Does anyone hear my prayer? What's for dinner? What will make me happy? Why don't good things last forever? What is God really like? Does anyone else even ask themselves these questions? Hey everyone, I've got an amazing Alpha Online group here. A better place to ask life's big questions. Ask Alpha. Cry in your heart today should be one of, I am no longer staying here. I am no longer dwelling here. This is not where I stop. This is not where my life is lived out. I am moving forward. I am moving on and I am pressing into the things of God. And I would encourage you as you do that today, as you stand up again, as you press into the promises of God and as you take hold of Him, He will take hold of you and he will lead you forward into the fullness of the life that he has for you. There are two great scriptures in the New Testament. One of them says, with God, all things are possible. And we believe that. We know God can do anything. 
But we also read in another place, all things are possible to him who believes. This teaching that we're doing in this series is designed to bring you into that place where you will be fully convinced that you and God make a winning team. We've been hearing great testimony of God's faithfulness in this season. What can our team pray for for you? Do you have a praise report or a testimony that you'd love to share? Send it in. in your heart today should be one of I am no longer staying here I am no longer dwelling here this is not where I stop this is not where my life is lived out I am moving forward I am moving on and I am pressing into the things of God and I want to encourage you as you do that today as you stand up again as you press into the promises of God and as you take hold of him he will take hold of you and he will lead you forward into the fullness of the life that he has for you. Hey, we're Andrew and Sue Owen. We've been on an adventure with God for many years and we've been pursuing our destiny and in the process, destiny ministries and destiny churches have been created. And we want you to connect with us with Church Online, all of the different things that we do every week, just so that we can be in touch with you and you can be in connection with us. We're an international family, people from all over the planet, every language going. So wherever you are, we would love to hear from you, share life with you. Let's get on that adventure together and do great things for God. Yeah, we love you, we're praying for you, we're rooting for you.